So they begin Canto 23, walking slowly like Friars Minor, Dante remarks. They're humbled by their seeming escape from the ten demons who they've left fighting amongst themselves and they're proceeding along the top of the bank between the fifth and the sixth bolger. And Dante is reminded of a tale of Aesop. Um, it probably wasn't actually one of Aesop's fables, but um, it's an Aesop-like tale um, concerning a mouse and a frog. And the tale is that a mouse wanted to cross a river and saw a friendly frog, and the frog offered to tie the mouse to his back leg and pull him across. But when they set out, the devious frog plunged to the bottom of the river and attempted to, dr to drown the mouse. And then overhead swooped a, ha a hawk or a falcon and seeing the drowning mouse went down to scoop it up out of the water as prey and of course pulled the frog up as well and ended up consuming both. It's a tale of trust and deviousness and how they can spiral out of control so that very quickly events you hadn't even anticipated occur. It's a bit like what's happened to them so far, Dante muses. And then it prompts a further thought, a bit like I think the falcon who suddenly appears swooping down to lift the mouse and then the frog too. Dante thinks, my goodness, but those demons who are behind us are going to be even more furious now because they're going to see that the soul who escaped them by plunging back into the pitch was doing so because he'd managed to co-opt Dante and Virgil into his trick to de defeat the demons. And so they're now going to be swooping after Dante and Virgil like the falcon. And it says that his fear returns doubly so, his skin tightened, and he turns to Virgil in complete distress once more. Within a few short tersets, the mood of this canto has changed again, and fear has returned. They're in hell. However, they're a bit more prepared to cope with the fear this time. Virgil is humbled too by the whole experience, and when Dante calls out, he replies that his thoughts are going along very similar lines. He says our minds are beginning to join again once more, this thing that had become so separate in their recent escapades across the Bolgia. But now their minds are starting to be aligned with one another, um, which also means being aligned with um, the divine mind and how to find the right path. And so Virgil has a plan. He says, look, we can just go down into the sixth bulger, um, this one that they're tracking, just to send into it, because he knows that the demons won't be able to follow them there. They, although they're very powerful in the fifth bulger, um, they must stay in the bulger that they guard over, and they can't um, overstep the order of Malabolge, um, so Virgil and Dante can make their escape. No sooner has Virgil uttered these words, then they see the demons fast approaching. And then in a very touching moment, Virgil grabs Dante once again. And this time it says he holds him to his chest like a mother would a child, not thinking of her own safety at all, but purely of the need to protect her infant, not even worrying about dressing herself like a woman who might escape the flaming house with her children. And they shoot off down the six bulgers banks like water tumbling through a mill it says capturing something of their fall because there's jagged rocks a bit like the water tumbling over the blades of the water mill and they get to the bottom and look up and sure enough see the ten lowering over leering over the top glower, glowering down at them but they've made their escape it's a really striking moment and i think it's supposed to carry an echo of divine grace working even as they're fleeing to escape demons. Because you might say that with Dante's fear moderating and Virgil's overconfidence moderating, they're brought together with a new, a refreshed tenderness, a refreshed love for each other. And that creates the sense of a divine moment 
um, that enables them now to readjust, to recalibrate and see where they've ended up now in the sixth bolger. They look around and immediately see slow processions of monk-like figures. They're wearing great capes, great hoods. Dante, in a bit of a knock at the Cluniac friars, describes them as um, rather excessive and baggy and ostentatious. And it's said that they're painted, they're lacquered, they're covered on the outside with gold and shimmering fabric, and yet walking so slowly, um, also full of tears, they're mourning um, these souls who are trapped now in this new sixth bolger. Um, and they're also, they look terribly fatigued by these um, garments that they're wearing. Dante turns to Virgil and says, look, find me a soul who I know, who I knew in life, so that I can converse with him and learn what their suffering's about. And actually, there's a nearby Tuscan who hears Dante speak and says, you know, I can help you there. I um, am from those parts. Dante turns to see who has spoken and sees a pair walking together. And they're amazed to see Dante speaking. They say they see his throat moving. They see that he's alive and yet in this bolger, not wearing one of these cloaks. And they ask Dante to explain who he might be. Dante says quite briefly that he's from the city, from the bank on the banks of the Arno, like they are. And he asks them to explain how they come to be in what's called the College of the Sullen Hypocrites. It turns out that they're two jovial friars. Jovial friars were friars who lived a rather easy life, in fact. They could marry, they could have a lot of creature comforts. Um, so maybe there's a sense of hypocrisy here, though they donned the mantle of Francis, they were hardly living ascetic lives. They're called Catalano and Lodoringo, and it turns out that they were two friars, one um, from each side of the Florentine civil war, a Guelph and a Ghibelline, and they were appointed, both of them, to become mayors of Florence, a sort of joint mayoralty. The idea being that they might bring peace to their city. But it turns out that they were papal appointments and the Pope was on the side of the Ghibellines. And so, in fact, their appointment just stirred up the civil war all the more when the Pope intervened. And so they were indeed hypocrites. They were false peacemakers and they were actors pretending to play a part um, and so now they find themselves in this circle of hell close to other civic offenders people whose duplicity caused a lot of suffering to many many others we also learn a little bit about why they're stuck in this sixth bolger why they found themselves in hell and remained there because it's said that they want to move as fast as Dante and Virgil can, and yet are held back by the weight of their heavy gowns, the weight of their hypocrisy. And the idea there, I think, is that they can't own their sin, they can't admit to it, they can't ask for the forgiveness that would be needed to escape, um, and so are stuck in this slow, slow round. They don't want to pay the price and I suppose that's another inflection on their hypocrisy that they are whitewashed sepulchres to use the biblical allusion which I guess is also reflected in their shiny surface and interior emptiness. Dante is about to turn on them he says oh friars wretched but he's stopped in his tracks because he then sees sights of something else he sees a man pinned to the ground of the bolger with three stakes driven through his hands and feet. He's crucified to the ground. It's another horrible sight. He's writhing around. There are great sighs heaving from his twisted body. And Catalano explains who he is. It turns out that he's Caiaphas, the great high priest, who thought it was expedient to sacrifice one person, Jesus, for, um, in order to save many people, 
This was the hypocritical deal that Caiaphas is said to have done with Pontius Pilate, um, because, of course, really he wanted just to be rid of Jesus. And then Catalano adds that this one man sowed the evil seed for his people. What's meant by this is that the Jews were punished for crucifying Jesus by the destruction of the temple in 70 AD. Now, this is an uncomfortable moment for us now because it's part of Christian anti-Semitism. But I think what Dante is actually doing is calling that into question because he puts the idea that Caiaphas was the evil seed that then God punished the rest of the Jewish people for into the mouth of Catalano. You know, this is a hypocrite. This is someone who doesn't really know what he's saying, can't, up, can't own up to his own faults, let alone make accurate um, accusations against others. And it's led commentators to note, actually, that Dante doesn't have living Jews in hell. He only has biblical Jews, um, a few of them, like Caiaphas. Um, so, for example, he could have easily fallen on the anti-Semitic trope of having Jews in the circle of the usurers, and quite clearly doesn't. They're all Florentine Christians. And I think this is another way in which Dante's reforming the assumptions of many Christians of the time. He's beginning to undo what has been a terrible stain upon the Christian tradition, of course, which we, in the after the 20th century, know perhaps even more fully than Dante did in his own. If Dante is making deep, implicit judgments of the Christian tradition, Virgil, in the poem, when he sees Caiaphas on the ground, stops in absolute amazement and stares at Caiaphas. And it seems that a kind of inner reform is going on in Virgil, too. Commentators do debate what this was about. My take on it is that we just heard that Caiaphas is accused of having done an expediency, sacrificing one person for the sake of the many. And I think this jolts Virgil because he sees the extreme punishment now that Caiaphas is suffering because of his expediency. And remembering that he, in the last three cantos, has trying to, tried to be expedient in his treatment of the devils. If you remember, it began with him hiding Dante on the bridge, thinking he could outplay them, play them at their own game. And I think this is a jolt now that brings Virgil completely back to his mind. It brings him back completely to being able to reflect on what's really going on, seeing that you can't play deceit against deceit. It only spirals down and leads to the chaos in the drama that they've been experiencing. Showing that he has indeed learned his lesson, Virgil now acts and he asks the friars immediately oh, for a way out of the bulger. Do they know um, a path up the bank that is easy to clamber out? And the friars shock him again with their response because they say, yes, all the bridges fell down. And the next bridge that you'll come to offers quite an easy path out of the bulger. But of course, this is new to Virgil, and it makes him realise that Malacoda had always been lying to him. There never was a bridge just a bit further on that they could be escorted to cross. And he realises with a chill that the demons were always out to get them. They were always out to trip them up, to throw them into um, the pitch along with the other sinners. Adding insult to injury, Catalano now mindlessly mutters another one of his empty truisms and says that the devil is the father of lies and all they do is tell lies. Only, of course, this time the truism is accurate and it strikes Virgil that he didn't see this most basic thing when he thought that he could outplay them at their own game. And it leaves him furious. Again, a fury that is not always bad in hell. It's a fury that can clarify, that can focus, that can bring new energy and action. And so it says that he steps off speedily now to find the way out of the bulger. And Dante, looking, sees the footsteps of his master that he so cherishes and follows him behind. <laughs> 